If you're looking for sewing inspiration and expertise, join Threads Insider. We promise to sharpen your sewing skills and to keep you entertained with complete access to more than 35 years of sewing content. Sign up now or give a gift to another sewer at threadsmagazine.com forward slash insider. Hello and welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Editorial Director Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by our Senior Technical Editor, Carol. Hello. And this episode, we're going to catch up with Susan Kelji. Hi, Susan. Hi. Hi, so happy to see you too. Well, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure many of our listeners are going to be familiar with Susan's work. Uh, she's a couture sewing expert, a sought-after educator, and a Threads contributing editor. She's recognized internationally as a top expert in couture sewing techniques. She's committed to preserving these sewing methods and has established a couture sewing school at susankelge.com and hosts couture arts tours to London and Paris. She established the Susan Kelge Couture Sewing Club on Facebook a few years ago and has created a lively online community where people share their love of couture sewing. Well, Susan, we want to catch up with you and chat about new things that you're doing. So thank you for joining us. Oh, always such a pleasure. Um, my revered and adored colleagues. So very, very happy to be back doing this. Well, Susan, we usually ask our guests uh, five questions about how they got started sewing mm-hmm. and some of their sewing history. Well, we've talked to you before. Yeah. So I want to ask you about what trends are you seeing in sewing right now? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. Um, Obviously, our lives have been impacted in a hundred, hundreds of ways by this this current COVID situation. So, you know, the question is, what do you make and where do you wear it? Right? Because that's that's always what's in the back of our heads. Well, that's all very different. And, you know, maybe in the past, I would have had people making evening gowns and pretty fancy stuff. And buying pretty high-end fabrics because, you know, it's a great chance to, to come to me. We, we explore this challenge together of the right fabric and the right dress and something very special. And honestly, um, people are making more practical things. Still, you know, to a couture standard, but, you know, I had somebody this week, she made a beautiful skirt. It was a Chanel fabric and we did some quilting and special stuff with it, but it was a skirt, not, a, not an evening dress. And I also think people are maybe exploring their stashes a bit more. You know, you're at home, you're you're looking at what you've got. Maybe there's that. Um, So people do seem to be, I hear that over and over. Oh, I'm using up my stash. I'm getting something from my stash. But really, I think the nature of the garments is changing a little bit. And, you know, that makes sense. It really does. Because where would you wear an evening gown these days? You know, maybe next year, but... But um, not at the moment, not so much. So I, I see that. I don't know if it's a trend or more of a reflection of our current, our current reality. Are there any new techniques uh, that people are asking to learn? Uh, probably with me, not so much. I did. It's interesting. I had a gal uh, do a coat. I just finished a class and she, she made a coat and she had Thinsulate inside it. Um, and I felt myself wondering, well, is that something we, and we did it, we did it, but kind of worked. But I, I think that was kind of an unusual application to work that into a couture garment. And it was a double face fabric. So that kind of added to the challenge. That was more unusual than um, strictly couture. No, I think it's it's just, it's ever fascinating because it's just a million iterations of what I think are kind of the tried and true techniques. I really do. Um, no, I, I don't think there's anything new on the horizon. Maybe it'd be good if there were, but you know, I'm so old school that, you know, just applying them in, like I say, ever, ever new, ever different applications. But no, I think that's kind of the same. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's funny, so, you know, obviously we do a lot of basting in couture, right? Hand basting and it's and, uh, what we do. And we always used to use silk basting thread. That was the standard. Well, it stopped being manufactured in this country and it's become hard to find. And I did come across some of it the other day 
and I was basting with them. I thought, oh, yeah, this is why we love this stuff. Oh, so basting thread. So in my little universe, that was a thrill to go back to that. But that's not new. You know, that's that's the old thing that we happen to come across and and use that. So. Well, I was going to ask, how has your teaching changed? Oh, well, you know, if I look at last year's calendar, um, you know, it was full of big X's <laughs> through all my classes. It was, uh, um, you know, but I did start up again some months ago. And, um, you know, we're, we're careful like everybody else, you know, fully vaccinated. We wear masks, um, wash our hands a lot, disinfect stuff. And it's been fine. You know, it's you have to be as safe as you can be and live your life. Um, so that's been great to get to get back in person. And we were starved for that. So classes, classes are, are back up and running, um, which is, oh, man, we all need that. Um, yeah. So so in a way, um, that's kind of normal. Um, and, you know, I, I do a a jacket class, classic French jacket class. And we've always gone up to New York to shop, you know, get in a van and go to New York for the day. Well, that's not a great idea. Who wants to be packed in a van with, you know, 12 other people for a day? (laughs) No, but it's interesting. And I think this is reflective of the online stuff. And I found people get their fabric just fine. You know, I have trims and buttons, so I kind of take care of that part of it. But Honestly, you know, and there's so much more familiarity with online shopping these days. Yes. And honestly, they don't need that trip to New York. It was fun, but it also gives us one more day in class. So I'm happy to I'm happy to have that because it's a big project. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit. Yeah, but but classes are back. The the European trips obviously were postponed. And, you know, we kept moving the goalposts on that one. <laughs> they were postponed and postponed and postponed. But hopefully um, London will happen in March and Paris will happen in April. So, Oh, that's wonderful to hear. It is. And uh, it's just a lovely thing to look forward to, just being able to reconnect to to that network of artists and artisans and uh, creators. So fingers crossed. I I think it'll work. Um, But yeah, we'll see. You know, Susan, in the years we've worked together, I've never asked you, how did you get started giving tours? Um, not sure how the Paris thing started. You know, it's so funny. Sometimes these things are just something somebody says and you get this idea in your head. And I think somebody said, oh, you know, you all this French couture stuff and you're connected there. Why don't you do a tour? And then you think, oh, hmm. And <laughs> so then you start. So then and that's. I find that's always my motivator. I always have to have that new idea, that new project down the road. That's that's kind of what excites me. And then, you know, back in the day, you know, didn't have the internet like we do now. And I remember looking through books and magazines and trying to get a sense of what I could do. And I'm always very careful. I, I always feel, I think like all of us, a huge responsibility to the client, the reader, the student. And you think, oh, God, I've, I've got to make this good enough. I've got to make it worthwhile. And I think I finally, and I met somebody there who I knew could help me out a little bit. And um, I finally felt I had enough pieces in place. And, oh, God, I remember the first time I did it, I was petrified. I don't think I slept all week. I was just, you know, it was the shakedown cruise. And um, will this work? Will people be happy? And and it, it did. It was great. So it's it's kind of gone on, but I look back then and I think, oh man, <laughs> I did not know that what I know now. But but it was great. And you know, Paris is such an incredible place. I always joke that you could park somebody on a street corner, you know, and come back and get them in a week and they would have seen fabulous things and had a great time. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's 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 kind of keeps me on my game because in the first place I have people who repeat the trip, so things have to be different. But people retire and they move, and you know we we used to visit um, the textile art archives at um, wonderful wonderful place in Paris, and then the archivist retired. Well, okay, <laughs> well, Le Lièvre, which was amazing. So that. Okay, that's done. We used to visit an incredible fellow who made parasols and umbrellas, and he decided to move outside of Paris. Okay. 
but it keeps me sharp because then I have to kind of explore other things to do, you know. And then London, you know, people said, well, you did Paris. How about London? Ooh. Um, and I, I had lived there for a long time, although it wasn't fashion related. Um, and then I, I had a student from the UK who I knew I could recruit to help me get this together. So that happened. And it's funny, for a long time, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, London is going to kind of take a back seat. I mean, Paris, how can you how can you beat Paris? Right. Paris is Paris. All things fashion, all things couture. And, you know, London, it's amazing because there's this history of tailoring which is incredible. We visit a Savile Row tailor. Um, and in fact, this is fun. So we were there, I guess it was two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. Dijon Skinner, one of the great Savile Row tailors. So they're very open about letting us see stuff. And we went downstairs where they have an in-house workroom. And they said, um, you can take photographs anywhere, but please don't photograph what's going on in that corner. Well, what was going on in that corner was where they were making Prince Harry's wedding suit, which we kind of put two and two together because we knew he was a client. The timing was kind of right. Um, so that was very exciting. So, um, oh, and there's the Fashion Museum in Bath and all kinds of stuff. There's, there's a huge history of things that are on at the V&A. So um, London, by no means, takes a backseat to Paris. So kind of fun. If you were to add another destination. You know, I, I'll tell you why I probably, and people say that. And one time someone said, oh, you should do Italy. Well, A, I don't speak Italian. And B, I don't have connections there. I kind of tried. And my husband and I, this was years ago, we did kind of a little trip. Well, the trouble is in Italy, you have to go to different cities. There's not enough in one place. And even I got confused after the trip. No, was that in Milan? No, I think that was in Florence. And I had these nightmares because, of course, logistics enter into this. And I thought, oh, my God, I'd have to take people by train through Italy. I could see the train pulling away and somebody's suitcases on the platform or somebody on the platform. And, you know, when you do this, you have to have all those connections in place. I mean, in Paris, if somebody needs a dentist, I'm good. <laughs> you need an all night pharmacy on it. And I thought, I, I just don't have that kind of backup in Italy. So, um, and at that point, I think, you know, I'm not a travel agent. So um, probably not, probably not a third destination. I don't know. If you could go on a, if you could go on a trip that was led by somebody else, where would you like to go? Oh, um, I would probably like to go to Central Asia to see what textile traditions are left there. Um, because if you look behind me, you'll see Central Asian e-cats. So I think, I think that, that, would kind of, that would kind of be interesting to see. Yeah. Susan, could you tell us more about the beautiful garment and the fabric in your background? Oh, I would love to. It's my, not my obsession, but certainly a passion. I went to Afghanistan back in the day in 1977 to run a clothing factory. And when I was there, I first saw these incredible Central Asian ECATs. Well, ECAT is a resist dye technique that's done in many parts of the world, Guatemala, Japan, Indonesia. But you know how certain art forms kind of reach their peak in a certain place at a certain time. So in Central Asia, in kind of the last half of the 1800s, um, ECAT making like this flourished. And um, interestingly, it was usually the Jewish clothing guilds that did it. And these fabrics were kind of narrow. So you had to put these sort of strips together. And they were often made into coats. And that garment you see is a coat. It's called a chapan, and it's quilted. And I guess that, you know, you would you still see pictures of these emirs, these wealthy people, men wearing these these ikat coats and they would stack them up. They would wear a lot of them and they would drape them on their shoulders. And um, I think it was a sign of being very wealthy, the more you had. And they also became stylized sometimes. Um, there would be there are some you see that have very, very long sleeves because they were on your shoulders draping. The sleeves were hanging down the back. So they became very long. So there are lots of different variations, but that's a pretty classic one. It's a tremendously time-consuming technique to do, but of course they could do it there. They had the mulberry trees in Central Asia that provided the silk, 
and, you know, this wonderful dying, that big piece behind me, and you're seeing two thirds of it, it goes down below this sofa. Uh, those are stylized pomegranates. And uh, so it's, I don't know, there, there's just beautiful, that's actually, um, it's probably, it, it could be a, a bed cover. Um, I have some quilts, I have some other pieces. Um, it's now difficult to find these really old ones. Um, I also do have one little piece in velvet, which is very, very special. Can you imagine doing this in velvet? Um, but, uh, and the one in the back, my husband brought back once from, uh, he was coming back from Afghanistan. And when he opened it up, it literally took my breath away. I just, I couldn't breathe. It was, it was so spectacular. And um, the UN at one point had had a program in place to help revitalize the ECAT industry in Afghanistan. And I think I would have loved being involved with that. But sadly, politics took a different turn. But there are places still in Central Asia where they, they do seem to produce ECATs the real way. Um, so what happened was in 1900, mechanically, you know, produced ECATs and they were a bit garish. They, I, to me, lack the charm of the of the real thing, but um, it's I, I find it quite beautiful. So we've done a lot of those around the house. Susan, the house, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. The piece behind you is that uh, mm. it, is it pieced in vertical? It pieces? is. It is pieced. It is in vertical pieces, and in fact, it's beginning. The silk is beginning to split a bit. So um, I have a friend who's a textile conservator at the Metropolitan Museum, and I we're discussing ways to stabilize it because you can't sew through it. You know, it's, it's just too delicate. And I wondered if it could be fused from behind, but she seemed horrified by that idea. (laughs) (laughs) I think she said, we generally, (laughs) generally try to avoid fusing, (laughs) but (laughs) I think the thing to do is probably take it off the wall and not let that, let the weight get on it. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure what'll happen, but um, in that I piece, mean, in that piece, yeah. Susan, is the uh, is it all the warp threads that are dyed? It is the warp threads that are dyed, and what and, they do, it's kind of extraordinary. So the warp, you, you warp the loom, and you bundle up the bits that you want to resist the dye. You take this off the loom, you dip it, you bring it back, you tie and untie and manipulate, bind it again, back it goes. This can go on. I think it can go on for like seven dips. So, um, yeah, you know, I always think of those Ukrainian Easter eggs that are covered with wax, you know, where you do the different colors and the resist. So it's kind of kind of related to that. But it's tremendously complicated, obviously. So when they changed to doing it commercially, were they still making essentially an, an actual e-cut or were they just printing it to look like that? I would think they were printing it to look like an e-cut. Yeah. 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 Which, honest to God, it's understandable. This would take really a long time, long time to do. Yeah. So, but then there was this wonderful renaissance when ECATs became discovered. And you remember this maybe five years ago, and you'd see it everywhere. I had ECAT dishes. I mean, <laughs> ECAT mugs. <laughs> I joke, all ECAT, all the time. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Susan, I believe you've recently developed a new studio. Do you want to tell us about that? I would love to. Yeah, this is very exciting. So I live in the country on a farm, and we have a barn. It's just kind of like, oh, let's do the show in the barn, right? Um, And so as part of, well, part of what I do and part of the sewing club, um, I'm a teacher, so educational things are, are all for me. So, you know, where do you film? And we used to film in the house, but it's tricky because you need a certain depth, and we have things hanging from the ceiling and it wasn't great and then we'd film we have a place downtown where we send out orders and we'd film there but you know a siren would go by or loud conversation outside so that wasn't great and um so then we thought well maybe we can build a studio in the barn so we've we've done that and it's just a big it's sort of a box within the barn if you will and it's gorgeous and it's just about ready to go um and it's, I mean, it's quiet out in the middle of a barn and a farm anyway, but it's really well insulated and it's big. So you can, well, you know what it's like with filming. So you can get the sound in place and you can get the lights in place. And um, we've just done the table. So I had a couple of 
army blankets. You know, we do the, the army blankets and the canvas over it. So we've got that. So we're just about just about ready to go. It's very exciting. Oh, Are nice. you doing your own? Do you do your own cinematography? Do you put your Do you put your camera on a on a um, tripod and hit play, hit record? No. Oh no 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 <laughs> no no. Fortunately, far more knowledgeable people than I take care of that. No, I work with a, a team of three other people, and um, so one does the filming and one does the editing. So yeah, so it, it's great. Yeah, and I think, you know, like anything, we've all learned a lot. And um, yeah, it's, it's, so we've we've got a, a couple of collaborations planned um, with some of the independent pattern companies where I do a sort of, couturize is a stupid word, but, you know, a, a, a garment with couture techniques, which I, I think is kind of fun. And um, yeah, I've got a couple of interesting collaborations in the pipeline. And we also have Another pattern, it was a funnel, funnel neck coat, which is just about ready because um, I think funnel necks are tricky because, you know, necks, if you've ever fitted a neck, you know, necks just don't go up, they go out. And so you've got to get some, well, this is true. You have to get sort of shaping into the neck. Otherwise you get lots of pull lines. So we've got a lovely, lovely pattern for that. But um you know, and we print our patterns out. So there's been problems with getting patterns printed these days. You're probably aware of that. Yes. And um, I, you know, there's always the PDFs, but I'm not crazy about those. Although, goodness knows, that may be what we're all going to be looking at in the future. Um, so getting it printed is one thing. But, of course, you have to get something graded. And grading is a whole separate universe. And it's been difficult to... I can tell you that it's difficult to get a princess seam that goes into the neck done in a larger bust size. Tricky, tricky. But I, I think I think we've got that worked out. So um, and I I think we know. Um, so we'll make a couple versions, one a longer coat um, with a placket and then a shorter version with a zip up the front. So we have to kind of choose fabrics for those. So, so that's I think that's next. It's next in the hopper. Susan, where do you find inspiration for your patterns? Are you thinking, do you think about what you want to wear and sort of building a wardrobe? Uh, how often do you do a pattern? Uh, you know, it's, it takes a long time to do a pattern. It really does. And you get, the, oh, we'll do 10 a year. Uh, no, you won't. You might, you're lucky if you do one. It's just, it just, it takes a long time. And we have our patterns developed by Julian Christofoli in Paris. And, um, then, like I said, you've got to get them, you've got to make them into patterns, you've got to get them graded and printed. You check them 40 billion times, and there's always something that works its way into it. Um, I think it's more what I think would be worthy of the efforts of my my students, I guess. We do, what, what I think is very cool, we have next in the pipeline, we have a couple of vintage evening coats coming one, which I don't know if you remember, it was that turquoise silk file coat. It was on a cover of threads. So that's one. The pattern for that is ready. Um, there's another vintage coat that I had found, I actually bought from someone, a beautiful vintage coat. So I think it'll be a two for, I think there'll be these two vintage evening coats, which I think are, are pretty wearable. And again, I always think, what's a good ground for couture techniques? You, you know, know so. you started out talking about how people are sewing more practical seeming clothing and yet they're doing it in a couture way. I feel like this is feeding into the, um, you know, the trend for slow sewing, the, the oh, idea yeah. that, that you're, that you're making something worthwhile. And I, I really do like how that, um, reflects on people who sew as, uh, conscious of what they're doing and not, not wasting time. You know, they'll invest time and they'll invest effort. A hundred percent. And yeah, because I honest to God, we, we all think about these things a little differently. And um, yeah, and I but and it relates to Sarah, your thought, are these things in my wardrobe? But they have to be if you're going to do this kind of effort, you want it to be in something special. So I think I think these evening coats or coats, I mean, they're just nice coats. I think that's that'll be kind of a good direction to put your efforts Yes, I agree. I've become very conscious of where I'm putting my time and effort anymore. Yes. Totally. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I is that because we're getting older? Is, is that <laughs> at least is your that, partner? Maybe, yes. <laughs> there's that. Um, but is it yet another byproduct of this reorientation of our heads? I I don't know. Yeah, I, well, I feel like to a certain degree it is. You know, I think that every day when you get up and get dressed, and you're not necessarily going back to the same office that you used to go to. It, you're looking for a different type of comfort. I mean, I didn't used to mind wearing high heels or stockings and things like that to the office, but I, I would not wear that at my house ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just wouldn't do it. Right. But you still want something that feels like it's worth putting it on so that you can feel good about sitting and getting your job done. And Oh, it's true. It's true. I mean, I don't think I ever descended too badly into the bathrobe, you know, sweatpants. Theme. I like to say I didn't get dressed up every day, but I think you want to look presentable. You know, you want to look nice. Well, see, I call them joggers because joggers makes them into real pants. They're not sweatpants <laughs> if you just call them joggers. I really miss um, wor- working in a creative office because I used to go in and I knew that Carol or Janine or Norma would notice something about what I wore. Yeah. And if I put an outfit together with some care or I wore something that, mm-hmm. you know, was a little unusual, somebody would appreciate it and knew what yeah. went into it. I really miss that. Oh, I and miss it too. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's like, unfortunately, you know, now that classes are going again, you know, it's, it's back in that sort of creative atmosphere, which, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yes. Really, it, it really, because it does feed you. It does feed your, your creative soul. You know? it, it does. I, I, first of all, it's true, Sarah. I really miss, and it's not, I miss myself getting dressed up. I miss you getting dressed up Aww. because it was always something to see, you know, that was new and different and interesting and, and, you know, inspiring, you know, don't have that quite so much. And even if you try to shop online, even expensive lines of clothing are often kind of basic these days. There's, there's not, you have to go way, way up in the designer world to find anything that seems particularly new or interesting or, or creatively inspiring, I find. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all, gosh, it's all so different. I went to a, um, oh, it was Thanksgiving dinner, and I wore a dress, a flower dress. My goodness, you'd have thought I was the Queen of Sheba. It was, it was only a dress, but it's like, I guess people haven't seen somebody in a dress for a while, right? It's it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the area in which you live can really change things too, because I've moved back to a very rural area. Mm. Um, We're currently in the middle of hunting season. So when I walk the dog, I have to wear an orange puffer vest, which I didn't have to do in Connecticut. (laughs) Who knew? It's a new one. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So uh, my dad is very funny. And my dad is like, I, I see your outfits catching a lot of looks at Walmart because we go down to the <laughs> to the local Walmart. And yeah. it's true. I'm often one of the few people not in, in hunting gear. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. Well, you know, these trips to London and Paris, and I know it sounds glamorous, but you know, work is work. It's, it's, it's a work trip, but still, thank goodness for that. It's such a great opportunity to get dressed up, right? Apart from anything else. And, you know, you're with, you're with fellow sewers. So you're with, you're with a great group who appreciate your efforts, but gosh, at least get dressed up for those, those occasions, right? Yeah. Well, so Susan, have all of the, uh, the crafts people that you deal with in Paris made it through the pandemic with their businesses more or less operational? Pretty much, pretty much. I have a friend, Anna Ruhonen, who is a Finnish designer based in Paris, and, and she was actually here at the weekend because she's been given a bourse to study in New York for a month. And um, so I asked her, you know, how, how were things? And the French government did help out, you know, in the beginning. You sort of told them what you normally made, and then they, they kind of made up most of it. So I think that really helped them get over the hump. But yeah, I was very concerned and I would keep writing to friends. Oh, is so-and-so still in business? And, and I would look sometimes to see, is the store still open? And um, yeah, I think I had one friend who um, used to be in the flea market, but she left before the pandemic. And I remember thinking that was probably good timing because I don't think that 
that it was small, I don't think that would have survived. But yeah, everybody, everybody's okay. And um, interestingly, in London, um, one of the things we used to do was go up to Linton Tweeds, which is fantastic. And they were very kind, and they would give us a tour of the factory, which is a very special thing, because they don't want most people trooping through their factory. They're there working, but they would let us do it. So that we will not be able to do because of COVID. And I get that. I you know, you wouldn't want a bunch of people trooping through the factory. And I can understand that that was a modification that had, oh, and also I just heard we used to, um, there's a, a part of London, you probably heard of Spitalfields, which is where the Huguenot silk trade started. And it's, it's fast. And we have a tour that takes us around and you see where all of this was done. And apparently that charity has shut down because of the COVID. We'll still be able to get our tour by one of the people who did it. But so that... That's no more. They could keep that going. Um, but I think for the most part, I think for the most part, things are, things are okay. Yeah. Oh, here, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So going to Paris, it's a big deal. And I have one student, um, it's her 50th birthday. We're going to Paris. And she's been planning the most fantastic outfits. A um, Watteau-backed coat that Kenneth helped with the pattern making. It's so funny. She, so she saw this wonderful design. I think it was a Jean Baptiste Valley dress pretty complicated. And she was in the class that Kenneth and I do every year. And she showed this picture to Kenneth. Well, you know what Kenneth is like when he gets a challenge. He's like, hmm. I could see the wheels spinning in his head as he sort of figured out, okay, how are we going to cook this up? So they did this and she and I worked later and it's fantastic. And I always told her, I said, you're going to wear this to the ballet in Paris. We go to the Palais Garnier, which is like a gold wedding cake. There is more gold leaf on that building, I think, than any building in the world. And I said, you'll go up the Grand Marble Staircase. I'll have a handsome Frenchman guide you up the steps. Fantastic. So the trip was originally postponed to last November. And I was looking at the ballet schedule. I think because of COVID, no ballet that week. And I thought, oh, my God, I've sold her on this idea. I've set the whole thing up. There's no ballet. So I was looking over, is there anything at any other theater or any other ballet? Oh, my God, we'll go to another town, anything, just so she can wear this thing. Well, the trip was postponed, so we're now going to be there in April. So the first thing I did, I'm looking at the schedule. What is going on? Please, please. So there's an opera, but it's an existential modern Polish opera. I think it's kind of the equivalent of Waiting for Godot. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty gloomy piece, but I said, I don't care. We're going to go. We're going to love it. <laughs> You're going to wear your dress. I don't care. But we're going to an existential Polish opera. So there you go. But at least it's open. She can wear the dress. <laughs> Dude, is there a baggage limit for your students yeah. who go? <laughs> oh, no. I have told her, I said, you know, you're going to need a, a, a seat on the plane. Like, you know, when cellists fly, they have a seat for their cello. I said, going to need a seat on the plane for your wardrobe. <laughs> So we'll see. Um, oh, but this is interesting. So I know we've done it in an article about Madame Paulette, right? This wonderful thing. So at one point she was making as part of her Paris thing. There was a yellow file skirt. It's fantastic, wrapped vintage design. She got a little bit of blood on it. So I said, okay, you're going to send this to Madame Paulette. They will fix this. Honest to God, you'll be fine. At, at the Couture House in New York, we used to send stuff all the time. You're good. Apparently they have a service get this, where they will pack garments and have them delivered in another country. Oh, so I sense. said, that makes sense. And I said, well, I mean, if it's not extortionate, maybe you could do that, <laughs> right? Have them pack your special garments and send them to Paris. Well, any listeners who have a destination wedding planned, this is an important <laughs> service to know about. <laughs> yeah. It may be. Now, I, told, I said, check it out. I'm dying to know what they charge to send a box of couture garments to Paris. But kind of funny that that was something that they would develop. But it makes sense, right? <laughs> Silly story, but there you go. <laughs> oh, no. Well, Susan, it's been lovely talking to you. We are we are at the end of our time. Oh, and <laughs> I don't know how sewing related this was, but hopefully it was fun. I don't know. No, 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 we've we've covered many sewing related <laughs> topics, and it's always so fun to catch up with you. And oh, I, you know, anybody oh, who listens is now going to want to read about iCat, and they're going to want to look up all the places you've mentioned in Paris. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And those people, they need our support apart from anything else, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. Jean Sen, Tissu Edre. Um, oh, Wolfe um, de Corti, Bruno Le Germain. Yeah. Yeah. All those places. Um, they need your support. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for catching up with us. Oh, my pleasure. Always, always love it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with threads. Thank you.